Thank you for joining with me today. Hope you're well. Hope your family's well. And uh, hope your faith is high. You trust God that God's going to take care of everything. and God's still in control. I had some humorous come to me the other day. Uh, precious saints have been checking on me uh, off and on. And uh, I've asked them to check on the elders in the church and uh, forgot myself that some of them classify me in that august group of elders. But my response to them is, is I'm good, everything's fine, etc., etc. The truth of the matter, I do need something. And uh, got up this morning, got to thinking about this. I need a good belly laugh. I need some people or something funny. I need something that just makes me smile and enjoy things. I don't feel bad. I've got joy. I've got peace. I've got um, things like that. But you know how it is. Sometimes you just miss just being able to be with friends and, and laugh and cut up and, and enjoy things. And the scripture does say in Proverbs 17 and 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, and the Lord knows we need uh, that good medicine during a time like this. But it also goes on and says that a broken spirit drieth up the bones. And I want to deal with some of that uh, in the course of this today, because we are, we are not only in a pandemic of, of this uh, virus, but we're also in a pandemic of negative news that is around us all the time everything going on, our entire world, our entire life structure right now has been impacted and affected by all of this stuff that is going on. It's, it's like living with a constant critic. And the Bible had some things to say about that um, because our homes, and I talked about that last week, but our homes ought to be the place where we have some of the greatest peace of mind, peace of life, uh, that home ought to be our haven. It ought to be the place where we go and, and find the center of our relationship, God there and everything else. But unfortunately, it's not always that way, is it? Proverbs said it like this in chapter 21 and verse 9. As a matter of fact, uh, the writer of Proverbs thought it was so impacting of a truth that, that he reiterated it in one other place as he was writing this and said it in an identical way twice. But he said, it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. I hope you'll forgive the reference to gender there. Um, truth of the matter is, I don't think it's solely uh, belongs to one side or the other side. It can be both sides that that bring about that kind of emotional, mental abuse uh, of negativity all the time. All I can say is you, if, you, if you're guilty of that, stop it. Don't do that. Uh, you need to love your people that you're around, the atmosphere that is in your home too much to violate it with that life of negativity. And it's not just, it's not just in husband and wife relationships. Paul goes on, or Proverbs goes on to say in chapter 19 and verse 13, a foolish son is the calamity of his father and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. It's like that rain that just drip, 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 drips. And uh, it's not too bad when it's outside on the eve, but if you've got a leaky roof and it's just dripping right there in the living room and you've got a, you've got a bucket underneath it and it's, it's holding that water, it, it, that constant dripping sound is, is, um, is really can get on the nerves. I excuse the, the reference, but the Chinese water torture. Um, sometimes it's bad on our spirits. Let me, let me give you another proverb. Chapter 13 and verse 12, hope deferred, hope pushed off, maketh the heart sick. But when desire cometh, it is the tree of life. And thank God for that tiny little 
three-letter conjunction that is in there. Hope being pushed off, hope being deferred, that which you really want to see come to pass, expect to come to pass, being ripped away from you is pretty discouraging. But thank God that there is that, that fact that, that uh, it's not always that way. When desire cometh, when desire cometh, it is the tree of life. It is the new growth of potential that is there when that, that desire is birthed inside of someone's heart. I don't know how many of you have ever um, suffered with some melancholy of your spirit. If you study the four temperament types at all, uh, you'll find that melancholy is, is one of those temperaments. It's actually one of the rich temperaments. Uh, it's the temperament that makes musicians and actors and artists and, and uh, people like that, inventors, uh, mathematicians a lot of times. Very analytical people fall into that, that category. And um, it, for it to really develop its, its great works of art and its great products, it, it requires some loneliness. It requires some being able to be alone and thinking. Uh, unfortunately, it also has a side effect of, of some uh, depression, some, some moodiness, some times where your world is falling apart. You can't figure it out. You don't know what's going on. And uh, it's during times like that while you're trying to put your world back together again that you go into a negative slide of emotions and, and um, if, if that's not dealt with in a proper way, then that same spirit of melancholy can drive uh, that artist to cut his ear off, that artist to commit suicide, that, that musician to do something that, that is so foolish, get into drugs, get into whatever, immorality of, of all kinds of, of uh, ungodly things. And so, so there is that side of it. But I, I remember the words of, of Charles Spurgeon, the great pulpiteer and back in London in the 1800s, he made the statement that shocked me. He said, I noticed that on the eve of God greatly using me, that I would go through a season of melancholy. And uh, it made me think and made me analyze some things within my own nature, that during those times where you feel like you're a failure. You, you analyze, you overanalyze, you, you pick your emotions, yourself apart. You feel like you aren't worth anything and don't want to be around anybody or anything going on like that. That it's not going to end there. I found that that same pendulum that drives you down will pick you right back up again. And the same motion that pushes you down will push you back up on the other side. And the result of it on the other side is those times that God's greatly gonna use you. Works of art come out. The, the great accomplishments are done uh, during those times. And so you begin to learn that God created you with that kind of a nature and you utilize that for your strength and not for your destruction. You begin to understand that even in this valley, there is strength for me in this valley, that there is hope when I come out on the other side. What am I doing here? I'm interjecting hope into a negative, negative world. Whatever is going on that is discouraging you, this too shall pass. Failure's not permanent. Success is not permanent. All of those things are not permanent. We will get through this, this stuff. Uh, whether you've thought about it or not, the world has had pandemics before. This is not the first one the world has ever endured, and it's not going to be the last unless the Lord comes back in a very, very quick way. But they before have never had the resources and the medical marvels that we have with the new technology and uh, things that we have at our hands and our resources today. And, uh, but you may, you may ask the ultimate question, what if I die in the midst of this? What if somebody that I care about die in the midst of all of this? I don't mean to sound crass, 
and I don't mean to put it into a, a lightly word or term when I talk about this, but, but I, I really wonder to myself, why, why do we hang on to this life as tough and tight as we do? If we really believe our message that living for God is going to prepare us for the world to come, if God is saving us from our sins now and that we are going to live with him for eternity, what does it matter? If we die, the, the question really is, are you ready to meet God? Is that one that you care about ready to meet God? Um, that's, that's the biggest question that we have. You can't threaten us with death because death is nothing more than a shortcut to glory and that which we have lived for and, and that which we look forward to. Uh, Paul told the Corinthians, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy, uh, thy uh, victory? All of that was, was, was triumphed through the resurrection. Jesus already paid the price. He, he took away the, the, the keys that, that death, hell, and the grave held, and uh, he came out victorious. Uh, let, me, let me show you this. That verse was... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 50, 55. But let me read you the verse right before that in chapter 15 and verse 54. He said it like this, and it's a beautiful chapter. The entire chapter is dealing with the subject of the resurrection and comforting us with those things. But he said, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It's not a message of dreary doom and gloom. It is a message of joy and victory. I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, trite here. I'm not trying to give you platitudes to it. I'm giving you the real deep, deep thoughts of my soul. And, and I am... I am looking forward to living with God throughout eternity and enjoying the things of heaven. And that's the beauty of living for God like we ought to. The question is, are you ready? And if not, you, you know what you ought to do. Now, let me, let me go back to my original thought process here. Uh, my wife came in the house the other day and she had just been talking to somebody. She spoke to me about something that I had have used in the past several times, and it brought it fresh in my mind. But uh, back back in the uh, mid 2000s, the book actually came out in 2004. I may have picked it up in 2005. There was a book written by a man by the name of Tom Rath, and um, the title of that book was "How Full Is Your Bucket?" His grandfather, Tom's grandfather, is a man by the name of Don. Clifton. Don Clifton was teaching psychology in the 1950s, uh, back before I was even born, uh, when he made, noticed a major problem in the field that he, he taught. He said the field of psychology was based almost entirely on the study of what is wrong with people. Um, and it, it, that's a very negative thought. I remember J.T. Pugh teaching us years ago, you cannot build a positive base, uh, a positive structure on a negative base. And so you have to, you have to do it from a positive structure. Um, he began to wonder simply this, if it would be more important to study what was right with people than it was to think to study what is wrong with people, focusing on the positive rather than focusing on the negative. Now, this is what I've come to realize. The pulpit can be just as guilty of the same syndrome of always thinking about what is wrong in people's lives, preaching to an audience and telling them how bad they are, what mistakes they're making, that can become a form of psychological abuse just as much as anything else. How can, and I've asked myself this question, how can dysfunctional people become functional if we do not teach them the right ways 
and, uh, and not constantly chastise them for the things that they've done wrong. I know we've got to teach them between the right and wrong. We've got to teach them. And there are times that we have to rebuke. There are times that we have to do all those things. Uh, but we don't have to make it a continual diet of that. As a matter of fact, if we don't feed them more good things than we do correcting bad things, we are creating a very dysfunctional congregation. Don Clifton taught this. He taught an analogy that um, he took off of a bucket and a dipper. We don't talk that kind of language much anymore, but back back in the earlier uh, parts of this nation, uh, if you was going to get a drink of water, you would go out there and either put the bucket down in the well and draw it back up, or you'd go over to the pump and you'd, and I remember doing it at granddad's house when I was a kid, getting out there and hearing the gurgling as you pump that pump handle and, and let it flow a little bit so you can make it sure that it's good and clean. And then putting the bucket underneath there and and uh, then you'd get the dipper and you'd, you'd take a drink of water out of that dipper. And so when he put out this analogy, it was a very, very relevant thing and common thing in many, many of their homes uh, during that time. But he said, everybody has got a bucket and a dipper. And with that bucket and with that dipper, you are either filling people's buckets or you're taking things out of buckets. That every interaction that you have day to day is a process of either filling or depleting, either placing something good in there or taking something away from it. And uh, it's either on your side or their side or both sides at the same time. It's, it's how we're treating one another. Uh, if humanity would ever live for God like it ought to, and the joy of the Lord would be the kind of constant across the board like it should be, uh, I'm telling you, friend, it would be joy forevermore because that's what the presence of the Lord is. It's not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy, joy in the Holy Ghost. Uh, but you're either giving positive reinforcements or you are taking negative withdrawals out of people and them taking it out of you. This is where it becomes very, very relevant when Proverbs talked about living on the housetop instead of in a, in a wide house with somebody that is destroying your spirit, negative uh, atmosphere all the time. It's hard to live into that kind of atmosphere until you begin to believe the very things that they have said about you and criticized you about. I remember years ago, Brother Haney was speaking to us uh, prior to him becoming our general superintendent. And he, he made the statement, he said, I have a problem with people always trying to label folks because they said the problem with labels is the longer they label you with that, eventually you become what they have said you are. And um, that's okay if, if they're building you and strengthening you. But when they're tearing you down and they're accusing you constantly, eventually, if you don't get rid of that kind of negative influence, you'll start portraying the very things that they're saying that you are. I don't want that kind of influence in my life. I don't want to be that kind of influence in other lives. I want to be somebody that helps fill people's buckets and increase their joy in life. Negativity literally kills um, the, the scripture talks about that. The tongue has the power of life and death in it. And so a negative life and a negative tongue can, can literally kill. Um, Tom Rath brought out a tremendous, tremendous story out of uh, the Korean conflict, as we have called it. When we were taken over there, to defend the, the democratic concept from communism. And South Korea was trying to hold on to uh, the, the democratic ways and they asked us to come in and help be peacekeepers trying to maintain that. So tremendous lives were lost, 50 something thousand uh, were, that died, I think it was of our boys in, in, in Korea. But, but following that, 
um, they, they, they began to study the men that ended up in the North Korean prisoner of war camps. They studied 1,000 of these men, these American servicemen that had been detained inside of those, those uh, Kore North Korean camps. And there was one trait that was extremely interesting and uh, pervaded all across the board uh, that, that just was shocking. It devastated, had a devastating impact upon the subjects. The, the American servicemen that were detained in those camps, oddly enough, were not um, treated unnecessarily what was considered by Geneva Conventions cruel or unusual. And in those ways, they most of the captives had adequate water, food, shelter. Uh, they were not subjected as much to the physical torture and torment like uh, the things were under the Japanese and just a few uh, years prior in World War II. There were less reports of physical abuse by the North Korean army uh, in the POW camps than any other major military conflict throughout our history. Now, the odd thing was we had more of our soldiers die in the Korean prisoner of war camps than in the other war camps. Why? They were not hemmed in by barbed wire. The guards did not surround the camps, but the soldiers did not try to escape. Uh, many times the men would break ranks um, and turn against one another, and they would in, in they would somehow develop close uh, relationships with their northern uh, Korean captors, and all of this was a very perplexing thing. When the survivors were released by the uh, Red Ar the Red Cross group, and taken into Japan, they were given a chance to phone their loved ones and let them know that they were alive and that they were okay. But very few of them ever picked up the phone to make the call. When they come, came home, oftentimes, these soldiers maintained no friendships or relationships with that one another that were inside of those camps. This is very odd. Usually soldiers um, that are in the army, they are a brotherhood and they, they stay very close and very tight. They stay in touch with one another, not these men. So the man that began to study these found out that there was a new disease in the prisoner of war camps. It was a disease of extreme hopelessness hopelessness. It was not uncommon for a soldier to wander into his hut and uh, to, to look around despairingly and decide that he dis was not going to participate any further in life and even into his own survival. He'd go into a corner of the hut and sit down, and pull a blanket over his head and literally sit there until he would be dead within a couple of days. The soldiers actually called it give up itis. And um, the doctors ended up labeling, gave it a name called marasmus. And uh, it meant a lack of resistance, a passivity. They, they could be hit, they could be spat upon, they could be slapped. And uh, normally they would have became angry. And if they had been, if they had been mistreated like that, that anger would have provided motivation for survival, but instead, in the absence of any kind of motivation, they just died. There was no physical, um, medical justification for their deaths. They just gave up and died. So it was the highest of all the 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 uh, pri the uh, deaths of all the prisoners of war camps throughout history. Thirty-eight percent of the men that went into those camps ended up dying inside of that. And you asked the question, they asked the question, how could something like that happen? And so they used what uh, this man Myers said 
was the ultimate weapon of war. Now, I want you to pay attention. Don't, don't drop off on me now because you got to understand the enemy is wily and he is smart and he knows how he put this kind of evil into the North Koreans and he still operates with the same playbook today as he did back then. This ultimate weapon of war. What happened was the North Korean soldiers denied the American men the emotional support that comes from intimate, close uh, relationships, from interpersonal relationships. They use four tactics to achieve this. Number one, they encourage people to inform on each other when little infractions were going wrong. I've seen in things in the news lately that has been so disturbing because I've seen police departments encouraging neighbors to rat people out if they have joined up in more than one or in larger groups than what they're supposed to. What they did back then is they would, they would inform them to break up these relationships. They knew that if they could get each other to dip out of each other's buckets and to deplete that supply of emotional support, that it would harm them. The second thing that they would do is they would participate in self-criticism. They would get them in groups acting like it was a self-help group. And when they would do that, these prisoners would have to stand up and confess to all the other prisoners the bad things that they have done. And by doing so, they, they begin to erode the, the, the care, the trust, the respect, the acceptance that soldiers had one for another. And so they, the North Koreans created an environment where the buckets of goodwill and support were constantly and ruthlessly drained out from one another. The third thing they did is they broke loyalty with leadership and country. And if we're not seeing this in the mainstream media right now, uh, either you're not listening to it or you're blind to it, because what is going on right now is they are, they are breaking up our respect for our nation, for our government, for our leaders, and they're destroying us through negative stuff constantly in the news every day. This is what the North Koreans did. They, they undermined the soldier's allegiance to his superiors. Uh, and once that relationship was broken, the soldiers simply didn't care about one another anymore. One particular case was uh, they were going through a field one time and the lead officer uh, noticed one of the men reaching down and scooping up some water to drink it. And he told him, he said, don't do that. Uh, you, you, it'll destroy you, it'll kill you. It's got bugs in it that you can't handle. And the man looked at him and told him, said, you're not my boss anymore. You're, you're not my commanding officer anymore. I'm no longer in the army or whatever and he drank it. Well, the, the things in him uh, set up dysentery and he died within a few days simply because he disobeyed an order. A cardinal rule that a good soldier knows that you cannot do. And I, wanna, I want you to understand that is exactly what the enemy would like to do. He'd like to destroy the respect of elders. He'd like to destroy the respect of, of leaders and, and, and do that. Take it away. Don't let that spirit get into your home. Don't let that spirit of criticism get in you about leadership. The fourth thing that they would do is they would withhold all forms of positive emotional support. They'd even allow them to get mail in from the United States, but they would go through that mail and anything that had good news, they would, they would not allow that to get through. If somebody would, would, would get a letter, a Dear John letter, a letter of somebody dying, negative things like that, then make sure those letters got through, but not anything that had positive things, only negative news and reinforcements of their plight was allowed to get through. All of that together, created this atmosphere of marasmus, give up itis. And this is what the enemy would like to do. The enemy of our soul is a master at discouragement. 
He is a master. At. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the father of all lies. He's a liar and the father of lies. Fear is one of his favorite tools, along with anger, hatred, strife, all of those kind of things, the, 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 the um, work of the flesh, all of those things are negative and destroy relationships. They don't build relationships. They don't help. Like the predator that he is, he will isolate you away from the pack so that he can kill you. This is one of the things that makes a pastor's heart hurt in the fact that we can't have church together like we should, like we ought to. Uh, the bonding, the praying for one another, the caring for one another, the things that can only happen when we're together. And, uh, and so I'm pleading, I hope that you take these, these video services as seriously as you can because you need them. You need your family. You need some positive things put back into your life. Alone, if he can isolate you, he can destroy you. He'll wear you down until he literally destroy you. But devil, you either don't know the word of God or you're ignoring some things because his word says, I am never alone and I am not forsaken. He will not forsake me. He said, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I want you to understand something, friend, that God is always going to be there. You reach up and touch him, he'll be there. You call on his name, he's going to be there. And he cares about you. Psalms 23 is a very powerful thing to read during all this stuff. Thou preparest, verse 5, a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. If no one else can fill that thing, if no one else will be around to fill that, I'm telling you, you've got the power of prayer. You've got the time you can go and encourage yourself with the Lord like David did. Sometimes you just have to do it all by yourself. Nobody's going to shout with you. You need to shout by yourself. Just get into a place and pray until, until God begins to flush out the negative junk out of your mind put faith back into you, put praise back into you, put the word of God back into you, and you'll know that God is in control. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Pray until the joy of the Lord just flows over in your spirit and your soul again. And body, church family, I, I just want to implore you, uh, be careful how you talk to one another. Watch your responses to each other and, and, and build one another, encourage one another. Um, we live in a world that it's almost so against all of that. You can't tell a girl that she looks pretty anymore because that's sexual harassment. And, and it's so unfair because you, you, this, the enemy has, has made everything good bad. He's made everything beautiful. There's some kind of bad motive just connected to it. No, no, it's not. We love you. We care about you. God, God made you, and you are a beautiful individual. You're, you're, I miss your laughter. There's some of you that I've got running through my mind right now. I wished I could just get a house with a with as cool as it is outside today, a nice warm fire in the fireplace, and some mochas and and uh, cookies and chips and just comfort food and tell funny stories and laugh and cut up. We'll have a lot of time to do it in heaven. But until then, make the, your time on earth a little heaven on earth. If you need us, you know what to do. I've said it in other videos. Call us. The number is on the screen. Call us so that we can pray for you. I'll put you in touch with somebody until the day is that we can get together, I want to help you get connected with somebody that does care about you. God loves you, my friend, and uh, he is not going to give up with you, on you. And so your strength is in the Lord. Your joy is in his presence. Get into his presence and, and find the joy of the Lord. God bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.